Hello. This video is all about performance graphs, the ones you tend to see as part of the PPL and LAPL performance written examination. They're popular with aircraft manufacturers and Piper Beechcraft are just two examples where their aircraft flight manuals use these for both takeoff and landing performance calculations. Let's take a look at one in detail and once we understand the workflow, we'll try and work out takeoff ground roll calculation. Our example performance graph is for a typical PA28161 Warrior II. At first glance it can look a bit daunting, but it really isn't complicated. It's just a way of inputting multiple data points to produce a useful outcome, in this case, take off ground roll distance. The graph itself only looks confusing because it's actually three graphs that have all been put together back to back. We're now going to look at each section individually to better understand them before joining them back together again later on. Here is the first graph. It has an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis is your outside air temperature. The y-axis, and not a lot of people realise this, but it's actually the takeoff ground roll. The graph also has a number of pressure altitude reference lines. The input data we need to start this is the outside air temperature and our airfield pressure altitude. Let's use an example temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and say that our airfield is at a pressure altitude of 1000 feet today. We enter the graph on the x-axis at the plus 20 degrees Celsius and travel up using the grid as a guide until we reach the 1000 foot reference line. We stop here and now travel to the right to exit the graph. The point of exit is our takeoff ground roll, which we read off from the y-axis. Using our example, the answer is 1450 feet. A point to note about the pressure altitude reference lines, they are drawn at 1000 foot intervals and if the calculated pressure altitude for the days between these, then you must interpolate between the lines. For example, if our pressure altitude was 3,500 feet on a particularly bitter minus 20 degrees Celsius day, then we would stop our vertical travel at this point here, which is between the 3,000 and 4,000 foot reference lines. Finally, this graph makes an assumption that the aircraft is at its max all up weight. So this is where the second graph now comes into play. So here is the second graph. Again, it looks a little daunting at first, but again, it isn't a complicated procedure to get your head around. For this graph, the input data we need to start is the result from our previous graph, in our case, the 1,450 feet, and our aircraft's calculated takeoff weight. We enter the graph on the y-axis, our takeoff distance. We then parallel the nearest curved reference line until we meet the vertical line of our takeoff weight. Let's use an example of 2,200 pounds. Here we enter the graph at 1,450 feet. We parallel the nearest curve and we stop at the 2,200 pound vertical line. We now exit the graph horizontally to the right as before, which gives us an updated takeoff ground roll of 1,160 feet. This makes perfect sense, a reduced ground roll because we're lighter. A point to note on this graph is the liftoff speed along the top. In our example, we should lift off at 48 knots. Had we been at maximum all up weight, then our liftoff speed should be 52 knots. A helpful addition. Like the previous graph, this one also makes an assumption that you have a calm day without any wind. And this is where the last graph of the set now tackles this situation. Here is our final graph of the trio. Hopefully you are now getting the hang of how to tackle these. So let's get straight to the problem with our final piece of input data. We'll need either the headwind or the tailwind component for our takeoff run. We enter the graph on the y-axis, our takeoff distance. We then parallel the nearest slanted reference line until we meet the vertical line of our wind. Note that the headwind reference lines slant downwards, which makes sense because a headwind will shorten your ground roll, whereas the tailwind slanted reference lines slant upwards. For our example, let's assume that we have a 10 knot headwind today. Here we enter the graph at 1,160 feet, parallel the nearest tailwind reference line and stop at the 10 knot vertical line. We now exit the graph horizontally to the right as before, which gives us our final updated takeoff ground roll of 975 feet. With that, we've completed the graph. If we now join all the graphs back together again, we can now see the path that our input data has taken us. With all three graphs joined as one, it is actually much easier to get to the final outcome, and now you can hopefully see the value in presenting the data in this way.
with a bit of practice, they become easy to navigate. Whilst the example we have looked at today has been the takeoff ground roll calculation, these graphs can also be used for takeoff distance, landing distance, and landing ground roll calculations too. They are all the same style, but created specifically with a data set for each phase of the flight. I hope you've now got the knowledge and the confidence to be able to work your way through one of these graphs and produce an accurate result. Good news for the written exam and even better for real life, where these things become a vital tool for the safe outcome of a flight. Finally, some tips for an accurate result. Number one, take your time. Even in the written exam, there's plenty of time to complete one of these graphs, so don't rush and lose concentration. Number two, use a sharp pencil or a fine tip pen. Blunt or thick nibs produce wide lines, which will decrease the accuracy of your result. Finally, number three, use a ruler to help you. The grid lines are small on these graphs and it can be easy to accidentally jump from one line to another without realising. Aligning your ruler with the lines you're following will help prevent this from happening. Now go on, go and practice. See ya.